Greetings. Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this special session of Stop and Sit. What is it? It is a mindfulness practice focusing on three ways to engage the mind using the acronym SIT. The stop refers to a pause. And the pause includes embodied awareness. And then sit. This does not necessarily mean sit down. You can be sitting, standing, walking or lying down, whatever the case might be. And you can still be stopping and sitting metaphorically in one's mind. To enter that spaciousness between stimulus and response. That is why we do it. My name is Anissa Wilhelmstetter. I'm a creativity and creative change coach and the founder of Creative Change Coaching. I'm also a writer, a, writer, a self-taught artist, and a licensed positive neuroplasticity training teacher. I'm delighted to be here today as your practice partner. And I will also be offering a little bit of information on habits, the habit loop, and the neuroplasticity of habit formation, which is the foundation of our stop and sit practice. So I hope that this has got your curiosity peaked and that you would like to know more and practice a little bit with me. With that in mind, heads up, I would like to share my screen to make things just a little bit clearer and cover a few logistic items. So yeah, we have it. Yeah, take a breath, adjust your posture. So yeah, we are training our minds to retrain our brains. So we're gonna be working with our minds in three ways, integrated into this practice. So you will need to be focusing too much on what are these ways, etc., And why we do it, to live in peace contentment and joy. I hope you're ready to join me on this journey. I love this quote. Stop. And then, do you have the patience to wait till the mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving? till the right action rises by itself. Lao Tzu, an invitation around stop, is an invitation for patience, waiting when things have been stirred up and we cannot see clearly. We no longer in the flow. We are in reactive mood, some automatic habit loop is churning, turning like a hamster in its wheel, or we behaving like Sisyphus from the myth, pushing that boulder up the hill, and then it's gonna fall down again, and we're gonna do it again and keep on doing it. So the invitation is stopping. It's more a mental attitude. And then, the sit part is where when we stop, we can help ourselves in certain ways that insight will arise and that will inform our action. So in this pilot session, 
the simplicity of the stop and sit operating system. And you can see up here, it's a mindful embodiment practice. So we're bringing mindfulness. The definition of mindfulness is being present in the moment with an open awareness, not trying to force anything to change anything or to judge anything. And then we want to feel it in our body. That is what mindfulness is, that you have a somatic experience and you're aware of that in a mindful way. And then we bring self-inquiry to take us through the steps. There are three primary questions, one per step in the SIT model. And then one can also support this with a journal. How simple is it? You will shortly see. So those are some of the key points already. We are already introduced the idea of stopping. And then we're going to have SIT for sit, the self-direct muscle. So that act of S of self-direction, we're going to look at it in terms of it being a muscle we're developing. These are all muscles we are developing. It's a useful way to think of it as a mental fitness training or mind fitness, mindfulness-based training. And then interception. Here I use the word interception. You could use, if it feels too warlike for you, you can use introduction. We're introducing inquiry into the rewards value of this habit loop, the behavior, and so on. And again, that will be clearer shortly. This is an overview, the key points. Third gear, this wonderful idea of we're moving in from first gear, the stopping and self-direction into second gear. And then there's a third gear where we develop a kind of needs consciousness, which is always critical when we're doing work with the mind and the brain, because our brain has evolved in three stages, each related to a specific need, our need for safety globally, generally. And then the next part of our brain for our need for satisfaction. The next part of our brain, our need for connection, belonging, acceptance. Another thing that's important in our session that I will touch on and just plant the idea of to guide thinking a little bit, matching emotions to needs. So emotions is an important part. That's why we do this. And of the habit loop, emotions get triggered. We enter an emotional state. And these are, provide valuable feedback into what we need. And we can start matching in our minds this idea of what need we're trying to meet and then looking for new habits, new ways to meet them. And then of course, as always, this is a practice session and we always look at how you can take it home to help it stick and so you can continue to benefit. Another acronym, you don't have to remember this. It helps me to remember what I want to cover, it helps it stick, it makes it interesting, it adds, it enriches the conversation, which makes it more likely that it resonates and it stays. This foundation of well-being, we're doing it all for our sense of well-being. For greater well-being is one of the benefits of mindfulness, countless research studies, and we always bring in a little bit of self-kindness. And again, with self-compassion, countless research studies to, to show that this works, mindfulness works. So in work, when you are more mindful, how would your work life be different? Your effectiveness, your efficiency, your performance, whether you are in sport, leadership, or any other kind of work, if your work is raising a family. And then energy. When we are more mindful, less reactive, less getting in our own way, less causing stress, less 
getting stuck into negative habit loops and negative emotions, destructive emotions. How does that contribute to our overall health, well-being, healing? It helps us heal from things from our evolutionary past in a way to overcome and from our personal past. Love, including our relationship with ourselves. So all ways of relating to people, including in conflict situations, when we are mindful, more responsive, more in the green zone and less reactive. And finally, learning. When we are in reactive mode, even remembering a grocery list would be difficult to put it in short-term memory between leaving home and getting to the supermarket in reactive mood because reactivity, including anxiety, takes up space in our prefrontal cortex, that front part of our brain. And in there, there is this working memory, this real short-term memory. And then with other learning, when we can use mindfulness, we are training our attention we are cultivating attentional balance and that can support learning experiences. Having said all of that, people get different things out of psychoeducational programs and really the results we get are largely up to us, us ourselves, whether we take the practices home, whether we are present with it. So why would we bother with this? You can look up the Center for Contemplative Research for a matrix of mental balances. I've listed a few here. But first, we do it for long-term inner well-being, eudaimonia, and being wise with hedonic happiness, the happiness that has to do with things external to us. Enjoying the weather, enjoying a nice bit of food, enjoying company, enjoying a nice item of clothing. We can enjoy those in wise ways. We do it to become more responsive, less reactive, to step into that space where we can make choices that serve our interest and helps us meet life's challenges and opportunities with calm strength and the greatest joy. And we cultivate all of these balances of attention with our thinking, cognitive balance, with our emotions, emotional balance, with our aspirations and motivations. This is called cognitive balance or motivational balance, ethical balance when we reflect on our meaning, purpose, values, and of course, to the degree this speaks to you, spiritual balance. Before we get into the session, one last item that is important to mention stay in choice this is an experiential educational session not psychotherapy there will be small segments of information sharing giving some knowledge around a particular theme and a typical session is nevertheless mainly practice as in any experiential psychologically oriented program it is possible that you may have uncomfortable or otherwise challenging experiences the usual guidelines apply, stay in the growth zone where you feel slightly challenged and yes, maybe even somewhat uncomfortable. If negative material comes up, maybe even you start feeling overwhelmed, you can let it go and return to an anchor, a point of support that we will set shortly, some more of that in a moment. And if need be, you can always pause the recording Move around, get some energy into your body, some sense of agency. The point being, stay in choice. Feel free to take what's useful and leave what's not for whatever reason. Our work, you will hear me referring to neuroplasticity. This definition is from Frontiers in Psychology. Neuroplasticity can be viewed as a general umbrella term that refers to the brain's ability to modify change and adapt both structure and function through life and in response to experience. So when we are having experiences, there is certain mental activity going on and 
that means that there's changes in the structure of the brain. And when there's changes in the physical structure of the brain, in the neurons, how they're wired, what is connected, how strong those connections are, and so on and so forth, it means that they will function differently. And so we want to make use of this. There is this term, positive experience dependent neuroplasticity. You can see neuroplasticity is already experience dependent. We're bringing in positive Meaning, we want to cultivate more of what is beneficial, so not used in a moralistic way, but what is beneficial. Creating more positive experiences, being more with our positive experiences in a new way, and letting go of creating negative experiences. That's usually when we're in reactive mode, we do that when we keep certain habit loops going, negative habit loops that becomes a downward spiral of negative emotions. So positive experience dependent neuroplasticity, positive neuroplasticity is using your mind to change your brain, to change your mind for the better, is a phrase Dr. Rick Hansen likes to use. So we training our mind to retrain the brain and that will change our minds, leaning more towards the positive. Before we continue, we will be returning to the slide on the habit loop, on certain events happening. These are some phrases we use and is used in different platforms when an event happens, for example, you just put your hand on a hot stove. So we're using that as a metaphor for when an event happens and you get triggered and this, an emotion comes up. For example, your friend yells at you, you get angry. So that is the event with its trigger, the trigger friend triggered angry, which is the emotional state. You can say, you take your hand off the hot stove, right? That's the ideal habit we want to cultivate in these situations. Because in real life, a natural reaction that is beneficial is when you put your hand on something hot, you remove it. And we don't usually do that. We keep it there and we keep it there and we keep it there in terms of habit loops. You can use, if you prefer, hot potato, maybe that's more evocative for you, or hot coals, you're not going to keep these things in your hands. You're gonna drop it. So we have this emotional state, perhaps anger, and then it triggers certain behavior. Perhaps we argue. And that's when our only tool in a habit loop, automatic pilot, reactive, is a hammer. And it's hammer time. We're hammering everything, treating everything as a nail. The friend and other situations. So I will stop sharing for a moment. And we return to our screen. So I've said a lot. And before I go a little bit more into it, I would like us to take a moment to ground ourselves, to arrive more fully. There might be certain things on your mind, certain things you brought to the session. And so this is an opportunity to reconnect in the present moment, if you haven't done so already. So whether you are sitting, lying down, standing, whatever your position, we want to set a contact point. So we can just allow ourselves, eyes open, closed, half mast, to slowly shift our, direct our attention into our body, to our feet. So 
So you might want to rock a little to adjust your posture and find some kind of grounding, a center of gravity. And then let that go to your feet so that you feel more grounded. You can wriggle your toes or create a little bit of pressure in your movements, push down against a surface that's supporting you. As you continue to breathe naturally, we're not trying to force anything. Simply being with the sensations, what comes up when you connect with the sense of stability. And perhaps even inviting yourself to allow yourself to feel supported, supported enough okay-ish enough. You might notice other contact points, your hands on your lap perhaps, your sits bone in your seat or on the couch or bed, wherever it is, the ground. And again, notice a sense of grounding and gravity that you're in contact directly or indirectly with the earth element. And you can direct your attention up your spine, your shoulders, that's all supporting your head. You might be leaning against the backrest and you can also let those contact points give you a sense of support, even protection. Then noticing that you're all right enough right now to practice, if that is the case. There's no tiger coming after you. No lion about to pounce and so on. And then as we draw this grounding contact point session to a close, this will be your anchor to use during the session. If you feel overwhelmed, triggered, bored, some kind of habit loop that doesn't support you. If that starts, you can always introduce. You stop, self-direct, direct yourself to introduce your anchor into your awareness. And then cultivate a sense of feeling safe, supported, protected via your anchor. And then lastly, as we bring this to its close, invite a sense of your positive motivations for this class for learning mindfulness, practicing mindfulness. This might be awakening, enlightenment, liberation, healing, growth, to help you with something specific in work, energy, love, or healing, to sleep better, to relate better to yourself or others, to be able to study something, learn to drive a car. So I wanna thank you for your practice. And you can bring some movement into your body. You might want to give a yawn and a stretch. And return to our shared space. Take a moment to register how that was for you. So what is a habit loop and why is it important with this operating system? An interesting idea to have an operating system for mindfulness, to engage our minds, to help us be present, more aware, clearer to see through our habit loops, what we're getting or not getting from it and any alternatives that 
are available to us. So I'd like to share my screen. Hot potatoes, hot stoves, hot coals, and the hammer. I keep hammering. What's that all about? The neuroscience of habit formation. Yeah, that's always tricky. Let's get me down here to the side a little bit. Yeah. Okay. An event happens. Your friend yelled at you. That's the trigger. Neurons. Register it. And as you come down here to connect to different neurons, different sides of the brain, whether it's the survival brain or this growth zone, your other part of your brain. When we go down this path, when we get angry, for example, or we go into a negative emotion, that negative emotion, the reactive pathway, that is now the pathway, the mental muscle we are strengthening. This pathway becomes stronger and stronger. You can see I've got roads, 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 roads becoming super highways. And we did not take this path of calm responsiveness. So this can end up being like a dirt road, relatively speaking. So this connections, these connections get stronger, stronger, become more likely and more primed to keep choosing this path and staying in this loop. Now we argue, and then certain states happen in the body, emotional states, and that will feed, becomes an event in itself and keeps feeding the cycle. The alternative we're proposing with stop and sit, here I'm showing the first step because this is critical. When something happens, we can stop. Just meaning this can be a fraction of a second. It's just breaking this spell to, to register. Hey, I'm feeling angry. Hey, I'm being reactive. Hey, this behavior is not okay. That's the responsive pathway. So we want to strengthen this. We want to bring like to escape that because I want to move some things around. So returning to the screen. So instead of strengthening this pathway, right? We want to go a new way. We want to start building our super highway here, this way. And we do that, we can help that by introducing the stop and sit. And especially initially, just this self-direct, self-direct our attention in a certain way, like we did in the centering practice just now, where we warmed up, grounded ourselves, and then at any point, you will stop if you're feeling triggered, overwhelmed, and you will remember your anchor and be present with that anchor, with those contact points. That's an example of stopping and self-directing. The idea being, if you do it for at least 10 seconds, it can be registered in the brain. A certain part of the brain would get activated, would show up on an MRI scan. So that's the idea, the neuroscience of habit formation repeatedly. So over six to eight weeks of learning to do this repeatedly will cause significant changes in the brain structure and function. What is a habit loop? I would like to suggest for you this website, Atlas of Emotions, when you go to it, not now, it'll look like this. You will have various options. Read more about that on the website. 
The founder is Dr. Paul Ekman, and he worked with his daughter, Eve Ekman. And this was by invitation of the Dalai Lama at a particular conference at Mind Sites. Mind Science Institute had, there was an event and this all went down there. That started this project. And you will be able to create a habit loop for any of your emotions, anger, fear, disgust, sadness, enjoyment. There are others, but they stayed with universal emotions. And you can read more about that on the website. So the example we used earlier is, the event is a friend gets angry at you. You feel anger. You argue. Friend, you could say, that's something that comes across as rude, inconsiderate. So that's the habit loop. There is a trigger. It triggers an emotional state. Something's happening in you, in your mind and your body. And there's a behavior. We want to introduce stop and sit, especially this first part, to interrupt this loop and create a new loop. Otherwise, you have that emotional state going to that behavior, and it carries on round and round like a hamster wheel. So we bring this in to create a new cycle of behavior. So here it is. Lots of graphics. I'm an artist. I enjoy doing this. It sticks better. It enriches the practice. Take what you want. We stop. And we self-direct. And even a 10-second centering rep, for 10 seconds, you pause and you be with one of your sensory sens one of your sensations. Um, it can be with heat, expansion, constriction, any of those, tension or relaxation, or with a sense, whether it's touch, sight, smell, and so on and so forth. And then there will be two other steps. We'll take it slow. Let's focus on self-direct. The second one, as I had mentioned, was intercept or introduce with inquiry to balance our perspective. And then lastly, the transform. We want to turn it into something. Here's your magic wand, the fire. We make better use of the fire. Instead of anger and arguing, we can be more creative with it and just learn from it, create something new. So the habit loop, let's focus on this S. When something happens, so we have it there, we stop. And the idea is you ask this consciously or implicitly hey, what's going on? We want to see that something's going. Or oh, there goes anger again. There goes judgment again. There goes anxiety again. There goes fear again, right? So we want to register something is happening. That we are in a habit loop, more importantly. And our emotions are indicating that something significant is happening to our survival. It's reacting in a way that comes from our evolutionary past and our personal past. So we do this muscle building thing. We self-direct our attention to something helpful. So we're not distracting ourselves. We're not denying that something's happened to the contrary. We are acknowledging, normally in reactive, we're not acknowledging anything, we're denying, we're distracting in the anger when we keep it going for more than 10 to 30 seconds, we are actually distracting ourselves with it. So now we wanna return ourselves to our sanity, to our wise brain. In a way, if you were talking about, another helpful metaphor is to see it as driving a car, we shift, into first gear, we stop here, and then we shift into first gear. Okay, what's going on? And as we did a little in, we didn't really go into 
initiate initializing or activating these sensors in our grounding session because that was to set a contact point your contact point can be the physical one that sensation of feet or back or whatever so part of your body and the sensations you get that accompany that feeling of supported you could focus for your 10 seconds on any of your senses sights you can focus on something you're seeing with soft eyes colors shapes so lightly or sounds again without judgment and so on sensations arise and fall off your chest or stomach when you're breathing and we will do some of that just now so here you are we will practice now more a centering practice beyond the contact points. The contact points can be used for your 10 seconds at any point. And then there's these other options you also have. Not always an either or, not instead of, you can do all of it. As you're noticing yourself being supported, you can bring in sounds. Again, 10 seconds will help take you out of the negative help habit loop and help you make a responsive choice. Again, I would like to stop sharing my screen. With this 10 second rep and this developing this self-direction muscle, in some programs they call it the self-command muscle. And there's some programs have an app to support this. It can take a week is dedicated to this part of the practice. Other courses, the entire course, even if it's a six week course, would be on overcoming resistance for one, to stopping, to overcoming and dealing with those blocks, to drawing the attention to the body and having any kind of felt sense, any kind of embodied awareness. So just to let you know that, that we can't force this, that this is a practice that in, involves learning and then it's a lifetime thing. We will do it for the rest of our lives. Not that we do it for a week or two weeks or even six weeks, then we never have to do it again. We, it is a way of being. So being with, being with ourselves. And that's also what sitting means. Like simply sitting in Zen, being with and letting it all be, letting go of judgment, letting go of the need to try to change it. So again, we're going to adjust our posture to make yourself comfortable. And because you are primed to notice your contact point and get a sense of feeling supported and okay from it, you can start there. And now some people are challenged to focus on breathing and in-breath and out-breath and counting with the breath. Some with parts of that, some with a lot of that. So what we will do instead right now, even though it does benefit us to really develop a breathing practice, simply exhaling helps. When we exhale, and let it be slightly longer than the inhale, not forcing anything or controlling our breath, just gently noticing that we can play a little this way. For all of us, when we exhale, the heart slows down a little. And this gives us a sense of easing. And when staying with that, that can shift us into a more responsive state. With sensations, we can notice as we breathe naturally now, the rise and fall of our chest or stomach. Let's do that for 10 seconds.
you being with the experience, flowing with it, having a sense of it, an embodied experience more than just a mental knowing that you are breathing. Letting go of judgment. We can, let's do it with sound. Listen to the sounds furthest away from you. Without judgment, without attaching to it, creating stories about it. And then we can listen to the sounds closest to us. And even sounds we ourselves might be making, whether it's a sigh, a creaking of the chair, your meal digesting, or you're hungry, tummy rumbling, whatever it is. Then again, slowly. We can introduce movement into our body as we prepare to return to our online space. So that's an example of an embodied experience. As we said, it can be really 10 seconds here. It was quite a bit longer to give you and allow for a space to really have and be with that experience to notice also any shifts or changes or any blocks that come up for you, because that would be a habit loop that you can map. And as you map it and become more aware of it, you can untangle it. So this is mindfulness, simply sitting, simply being aware and how we train our brains to be less reactive in certain situations. I would like to return to the screen. So we did our centering practice using only one sense. We do not learn from experience. We, there is the saying we learn from experience, right? You learn from doing it rather than somebody telling you about it. So that's why we were doing it. And still, in that context, we learn from experience rather than being told or shown. So this show and tell, yes, that has its usefulness. And some people are able, they have good imaginations. They can imagine themselves doing it. So they creating an experience. So you see that distinction. And then John Dewey says this. Now this is in comparison to something else. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. So you have the experience, yes, rather than not having it. And then you reflect on it. So he's not cutting experience out of the loop. And then what we're doing here, you will see in the three gears as we change, as we go through stop, right? That's like stop, first gear, Sit, S, self-direct, I, intercept or introduce that second gear, T is the third gear. And we have a question for each one. We have a core list of questions that can be used to challenge our thinking and change our mindsets. We are, after all, retraining our minds and training our brains and retraining our brains. So yeah, you have the questions, three good questions. What's going on? And there we're just exploring rather than making stories or diagnosing at the moment, right? Hey, what's that's happened? Okay, now what's going on inside me in response, in reaction? 
and just being with it. And being with it gives us a sense of grounding. And we can also introduce these 10 seconds. On that point, we can also introduce a richer sensory experience. For example, bringing the finger and the thumb together and rubbing them, even looking at them with exquisite attention, with curiosity for 10 seconds. You would have seen some pose that's something like that, right? In paintings, Buddhist paintings, for example, it really represents the simply sitting, the Zen. I'm with everything. Almost like a lizard in the sun. So we do that. There are other practices. There's one called havening, which can be with the hands. Slowly, again, for 10 seconds, feeling all the sensations, the textures, the temperatures. So you can try that. And havening, when you're on your own, can be extended to this kind of self-hugging and gently sliding the arms, the hands, and feeling all the sensations. So there we're introducing more actively something. And then there's some fancier ones that use the breath as well and more movement, including the eyes or tapping. So those are some of the options. And then I would like to invite you, if you have pen and paper, others do this mentally, stay in choice. We're not going three triggers here three chilies, hot chili peppers. So nothing that triggers you seriously or triggers trauma. We're not working on trauma. Choose something small, like really small. For example, if the friend yelling at you was not a three trigger thing, right? Then bring that in. So it was some small argument and they just raised their voice a little bit kind of thing. So in terms of emotionally, how triggered you feel. Something under a five is useful. Something you care enough about that we want to bring our 10 seconds into it. So we're just setting it up. I will stop sharing just now to take you through this exercise. You can do it as a contemplation, a visualization, a reflection, and so on and so forth. So there's a trigger. It could be for a craving or even that there's two triggers, friend, raise their voice. You had a certain emotional experience. Maybe your behavior wasn't that you argued, but that you walked away and then you went and ate something or you listened, you took it in, you kept quiet. And then you went and you, well, suddenly had a drink, a smoke, had a packet of chips or something right, and you weren't hungry. So there's a, there's a trigger. Yeah, we map what's happening inside my body and inside my mind, and we're counting those two as creating an emotional state. For example, if that state was anger. With the example of a friend yelling, it's often would be anger because Anger comes, it gives us this message that tells us about this need where we feel we're being treated unfairly. So it's a kind of drive. This emotion is like a drive towards meeting a need or defending a need. And then the behavior. So again, what behavior was driven then by the emotional state? The eating, the drinking, the arguing, right? We take a look in second gear. So it's like having this big magnifying glass and we really look at this emotional state automatic behavior cycle, this habit loop. Now we introduce, so we intercept even more 
in a more active way. So engaging the mind even more actively by looking at the reward value. What do I get from this? What do I get from when this emotion is triggered, telling the story, going for a drink, eating, arguing, and then staying in that or distracting myself in some other way, right? What? So we're present, we stop. Hopefully we can introduce those to a 10 seconds. Maybe we didn't, and so the loop went. So after that, retrospectively, this has happened. So we're looking back. Now we think of it. And now we can introduce the 10 seconds to calm ourselves and now in this moment. So we can look at this with a little more clarity and without getting re-triggered. So 10 seconds, and then we can be in our body, we can investigate, okay, those thoughts are happening. Mm, I'm thinking this, I'm thinking, gee, that's unfair. Oh, I hate this. I'm thinking, what am I feeling? Hot. It's almost like you're putting yourself in that, right? Situation. Hot constriction, agitation, and so on. And then, what do I wanna do? And then what do I get from this? And again, from replaying it and ruminating, so staying in the loop of thinking of it over and over normally, so we're not going into that loop. Here we inquiring, we investigating, and we're helping ourselves. So we're in responsive mode. Rumination is when you keep the negative cycle going. She did that and you're replaying it and you're getting in the motions and the emotions are feeding the thoughts, are feeding the emotions and so on. So you're regurgitating, you're caught in a loop and you're staying angry for more than 10, 20, 30 seconds. So that's different. There you're re-triggering, re-triggering, re-triggering. Here we're shifting into second gear hey, what do I get from that? And we're bringing curiosity and interest. So those are a little bit of third gear things we bring all the way through, even in first gear. Wonder what this is about. Why do we want to know? What do I get from this? When we ask this question, we're recognizing that there's some value, some reward value in this negative cycle. And that's what keeps it going. So we want to downgrade that reward value. We want to become disenchanted with the righteousness, the addiction of anger, for example. It can be very seductive. So we want to break that spell. We want to become disenchanted with keeping anger going and allowing ourselves to then bring in all these other negative behaviors. So that is a practice entirely on its own. You might want to pause the recording to map a habit loop, to bring to mind something like this, a trigger, the experiences. You can write thoughts there, put arrows or make a kind of thought map, then a map of senses and sensations. Here's your behavior. So here yeah, I've put it in a line, like an emotional episode timeline. Of course, you can put it as a, as a loop, right? You have your trigger, but this is the state and the behavior. You can put all three here, for example, as three circles. There's many ways you play with it. So when we draw into a close, slowly there will be the third step that I will introduce we won't go into it as a practice, but I will suggest it as a home practice. So I would like to stop sharing my screen. We're going to think of an incident below a level five. We're going to shift into first gear and we're not gonna force it. We're gonna help ourselves. That's why we're choosing a low level to see if we can shift into that second gear question. How about that? So with that, I'd like to stop sharing. So again, make yourself comfortable, adjust your posture, find your center of gravity. 
you might want to have a drink just to settle in. You might have your drawing next to you and your eyes can be open, closed, half mask, and you can always write in between. And again, you can always pause the recording. You can walk around, move, take as long as you want, short as you want with these practices. So connect with your, direct your attention then. So we've stopped. We're directing our attention to our feet to feel grounded, any other contact points, even pushing into it a little bit and really taking a felt sense of being held and being okay enough right now. Connect with your senses because we practiced sound or the rise and fall of our chest. You can do that. If you find it useful, you can do the rubbing the fingers together, 10 seconds. Ten seconds is more or less three breaths without controlling your breath. So think of the time. It can be today. Could be during the session. Could have been just before. Or well, something that's happening in you if you were to anticipate a task coming up. So we want to connect with a habit loop. The habit could be anger, irritation, frustration, even light weight anxiety, that you're going to be going to a new place, or well, there's some uncertainty about the buses and you have to get to an appointment. It's just meeting a friend for coffee, but you like being on time. So something really lightweight that triggers some emotion a little bit more than feels helpful, that you get tipped into feeling vulnerable, reactive, stressed, So what's taking up your mental space and getting in the way of you being present? So you've got it. So think about that trigger and some sense of thoughts happen, sensations happen in the body. Might be a sense of how disconnected in those situations one becomes to sensory experience and being present. And that's information. We distract ourselves. And you will have an idea of behavior that typically follows such activation or behavior that did follow such activation. Maybe you receive something in the post or open some email, something didn't look a certain way, or you're being asked for something, or something just didn't work. So whatever that is, the emotion could be frustration, anxiety, irritation. So judgment comes up of yourself, others, circumstances, things you, th you think you want to control it should or shouldn't be a certain way. You shouldn't be reacting in a certain way. You're judging yourself for not having reacted in a certain way. And then what behavior followed? So let's shift to first gear. Now that you've brought this to mind, Bring in your 10 seconds. Let's do this more actively. And you can have your eyes open or closed. If it's open, you can actually look at yourself. Bringing these fingers together. First two index and middle finger to the thumb. Then there's more texture, more shift, more interest. Just direct your attention, your body, and your eyes, your sight, with a kind of open, gentle, kind awareness. 
with some curiosity and interest. And then you can return to a contact point. And now we want to ask this question. Choose a part of your habit loop. It might be rumination that once that started, your friend was short with you, you got angry, and then the rest of the day you keep on playing that loop. That's a habit loop. So any part of it or behavior, you yelled, you argued back, et cetera, or you went and then ate as well. So all of that, ask yourself for, for it or for one part of it, what do I get from this? What do I get from arguing? What do I get from distracting myself? What do I get from going for that bag of chips? So getting to the habit of asking ourselves this question breaks the spell. It creates disenchantment, not to say it will do so immediately or once it's done at once that you remain disenchanted. You might need to repeatedly ask this question and have a foul sense of this experience of, huh, that's interesting. Hmm, how curious. Why did I think that will help? This is also used in cravering. You eat something, overeat something, or people who are smoking, when they're invited to sit with that cigarette and smoke it mindfully, or to eat that thing, or that candy bar, that whatever, that they tend to overeat or go for seconds or thirds, to eat it mindfully, like paying attention and asking, what do I get from this? They suddenly start realizing Oh, it's too sweet. Oh, it's this. Oh, I am full. Oh, that's uncomfortable in my body. And so on and so forth. So that's the idea of disenchantment. So I'm getting ready to, I would invite you before this to first connect, take notes if you need to about your experience, reflect on your experience, notice any shifts, notice any resistance. Resistance would be another habit loop. You could look into it. What do I get from this? All right. So I'd like to share my screen just to mention, yes, there is a third gear. In a usual program, you will spend at least one week on the first gear actively. Really immerse yourself, intense practice, and then add the second gear. And again, you would take a week, even two weeks on that. The third gear, the third question is this question, what is needed? What if it were more present in my mind would help me? What's needed right now? Kindness, space, take a wise break. Other questions, how can I help? What might help? what's important now so introducing a third question of this sort and what is also needed is we moving into transformation we're becoming even more responsive self-responsive open to helping ourselves rather than being overcome or controlled we can transform by bringing in more really practicing in a deliberate explicit way as formal practice, so you give yourself five minutes to practice self-compassion, or with the experience to sit with it formally, two, three, four, five minutes or more, with curiosity, hmm. and making the sounds, and really thinking, okay, when I'm curious, or when I'm innovating, what, do I need more empathy here for myself, for the other person? Do I need more knowledge? Do I need more compassion? Do I need more curiosity? Do I need more sense of purpose, more motivation? So you get this, you're exploring what you need, then you will receive insights and you will allow the insights to guide you to bring more of that in. Yeah, you see that we have the hammer. We become so blinded by rage or so caught up in the loop 
we don't realize that that is a screw I'm hammering. My tool does not fit the situation. That I do have a screwdriver and I know how to use it, right? Emotions, as we close, matching emotions to needs. When you're angry, you have a certain need, you can explore your needs and then ask what is needed? What do I need? And in the disenchantment, you realize the way you're trying to meet that need is not serving you. On the website, I recommend it. You will find details into all these emotions and the need it's trying to meet. With anger, we get angry when something blocks us or when we think we're being treated unfairly. So we need fairness and we need our path to be unobstructed. We need to be in the flow. We want agency, independence. So we did our presencing. You can do a third gear at home retroactively. This time you're going to think of to resource yourself before you think of what is needed in a situation that triggers you, that you wanna create a new habit loop. Look at examples in the past, even today, where you've been successful. Take in the good of that and really have a physical sense of the constructive action you brought. You took a wise break. You did not eat that cookie. And when you didn't eat that cookie, you didn't distract yourself with a cigarette or some other destructive behavior. That you stood up for yourself in a skillful way. That you introduced your 10 seconds. Even before you knew this practice, these are things we do naturally. They are not unnatural. We all know how to do it and we have done it many times before, including today. You could be doing it right now. So you brought curiosity to something instead of. So find those exceptions and start nurturing it and that will wire your brain and prime your brain and make you more likely to bring those in. And then you're always welcome to explore to take yourself through all the steps. So we have our inquiry. Insight is only 20% of what's going to help you change those habit loops because you saw we need to fire those neurons. They need to wire repeatedly. And when we gain insight about what's needed or that insight into that reward value can help break the spell. And then the insight into what is needed more curiosity, more compassion. How can I bring it in? Where can I bring it in? And so forth. Practice, practice, practice. So yeah, you see, you can do it formally, informally. I love doing it formally or at least having the chart and then it stays in my brain. You can spend an entire week, Monday to Sunday, Sunday to Saturday, whatever, however you do your charting just on the stopping to notice in an aware, open awareness way, just being, letting it be, not trying to control, not judging. You can upgrade it, stop and sit where you actually bring in for 10 seconds, something more deliberate. You can spend a week or two on that. You can spend a whole week on this. What do I get from this? Journaling about that. Then sitting, reflecting on the T of the transform of sit, reflect on past success when you brought empathy, purpose, creativity, meaning, your values to the mix. You could also map out a habit loop. Or you could just map out a habit loop as your homework this week or several. What was happening? Example, you had a long to-do list your child, your partner was irritable or ill as well, et cetera. So that's before that episode that happened. And then the episode with the trigger, your friend yelled at you and this emotional state came up of anger. Mind body experience, how did you experience that anger as heat, constriction? So then well, how did you respond or react? You argued. Then after the fact, 
there would have been constructive, destructive activities, behavior. You might have learned a lesson. You can write that down. Did you light a cigarette, have a stiff drink, eat candy? Or did you take a wise break afterwards, reflect in your journal and practice and make a plan for next time? So I want to thank you for your practice. We could have a whole session just on first year, another whole session on second year, a week later, as you practice every day, then a week later, another whole session on third year, and then bring it all together, and then doing different loops for different emotions. So it was a lot, you pause it when you're ready, go over it as many times as you want, take it slowly, thank you. Instead of being reactive, calling everything bad, judging ourselves, others, and circumstances, it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. That's a Chinese proverb. And any part of this practice, first stopping, first gear, second gear, bringing something in, third gear is lighting a candle. I want to thank you for your practice. We did go a little fast because this is a video. You did not have a chance to share your experiences, ask questions, discuss blocks, and strategize around that. You will, the invitation here is to use your embodied awareness to ask questions, to journal. And when you connect more and more to your inner wisdom, more and more, you will grow in self-awareness and the answers you can trust will come to you. And more and more, you are training your mind, you are retraining your brain, and that is changing your mind for the better. Thank you for your practice.